Hello everyone, it's Mr. Alviar, here to read another chapter of the exciting book called Cabin on Trouble Creek by Jean Van Leeuwen. We are in chapter 10. Something happened at the very end of chapter 9 that I'll reread to you because I want to make sure it is clear to you what is happening at the beginning of chapter 10. Sorry there's a glare in my glasses. I had to take my contacts out. They were getting all foggy. I think they're getting old, so I just threw them out, put my glasses on. I wanted to be able to see when I read because I don't like not to be able to see the words. I don't want to make any mistakes because I never, ever make mistakes, ever. All right, maybe a little, but hardly ever. Chapter 10. The end of chapter 9 first. Daniel stood back, looking with satisfaction at their morning's work, the new trap that they made. You cannot catch Chi Mamus like that. Startled, Daniel whirled around and behind him, tall and straight and dressed all in deerskins was a Native American. Chapter 10. Daniel stood still, his legs frozen. His heart thumped loudly in his ears. All he could think of was there weren't supposed to be Indians left in these parts. Pa had said so. What should he do? What should he say? Was the Indian alone, or were there more of them nearby? A war party? No. Pa had said the war between Indians and white men had been over for ten years now, hadn't he? Well, why won't our trap catch a rabbit? asked Will. He was looking at the Indian with curiosity, but not fear. Will's mind was still on the trap. Daniel knew that. Snare is better, said the Indian. He spoke in a quick, quiet voice, the same way that he moved. And because of this, Daniel had first thought that he was young. But now he saw that the man's face was deeply lined and his black hair, long and pulled back from his face, was streaked with gray. I will show white boys, he said. And as suddenly as he had appeared, he faded noiselessly into the trees. Daniel stared at the place where he had disappeared. Maybe his mind hadn't been playing tricks on him after all, he thought. Maybe this Indian had been watching them for days, even weeks. But why? What did he want from them? Will, he said urgently, don't tell him about Pa being gone. Why not? Will looked puzzled. Why did Will always have to question everything? There was no time to explain. Just, just don't say anything, Daniel warned. Let me do all the talking. A minute later, the Indian reappeared. In one hand was a long, thin stalk of some kind of dry plant. It looked dead. What use could that be? Daniel wondered. Swiftly, the Indian peeled back the outside layer of the stalk. In a moment, he was twisting fine strands of fiber into very thin rope. And then before Daniel could even understand how he had done that, he was walking around in the brush, his eyes searching for something. Ah! Here is good spot, he said. He picked up a straight stick and placed it across the low, forked branches of two saplings growing close together. And then he made a noose out of his plant rope and hung it from the stick so it reached almost to the ground. Chi Mamus comes by, puts head in. Bam! Cut! The Indian smiled suddenly. 
What was that strange word he kept saying? It must be Indian for rabbit, Daniel decided. You make more snares, the man said. Catch many chimamus. Well, he seemed friendly, Daniel thought. Still, he couldn't let his guard down. Grandpap used to tell stories about the clever tricks that Indians played on the white settlers back in the early days in Pennsylvania. They stole children and brought them up as part of their tribe. Sometimes the children weren't found until they were grown up, or they were never found at all. So this could be a trick. The Indian was speaking again. I am Solomon, he said. Well, that was a strange name for an Indian, a Bible name. Many was the night that Ma had read to them the story of Solomon, the wise man. White men gave me this name as baby, the Indian explained, at his mission. I I'm Daniel, and Daniel pointed at his brother. He's Will. Solomon nodded. Now what? How could Daniel find out what this Indian with the crazy name was doing here? You live in cabin? Solomon said, jerking his head in the cabin's direction. So he had been watching them, Daniel thought. No papa? No mama? Of course, he knew that too. Daniel answered quickly to make sure that Will didn't. Uh, our pa went to fetch some supplies. Well, that much was true anyway. Uh, he and uh, Ma will be back any day now. Uh, maybe today. And he said it again louder. Most likely today. Solomon nodded. That is good, he said. Lo Wan will come soon. White boys need warm coats. Lo Wan. Daniel repeated it to himself. Hmm. Likely it meant winter or cold, Daniel thought. Will had been staring silently at the Indian for a long time. Daniel thought he was remembering his warning to be quiet. But now suddenly Will spoke. Uh, do you live roundabouts here? Solomon didn't answer for a long moment. His dark eyes gazed at the ground. When he lifted them, his face seemed clouded. Once upon a time, Lenape people lived here, he said. Many, many years. Then white men came. There was much fighting. My father died. My brother died. Treaty says we must move. Some go north. And he gestured again with his head. My people go west. But I come back sometimes to trap skins. Daniel felt something that had been strung tight inside him begin to loosen. Somehow he knew now that this Indian was not going to harm them. Along with a kindness in his eyes, there was sadness. Maybe Solomon would even help them, he thought. Well, that was what happened in the next few days. Pa and Ma still did not come. But neither Solomon nor the boys spoke of that again nor did they speak about where the Indian had made his camp. Daniel thought it was somewhere upstream, but he didn't ask. He did ask Solomon how he came to speak English so well. I learn English as a boy at mission, he answered. Some words I do not remember, but I speak with white men when I trade skins. Almost every day Solomon would appear out of the trees as suddenly and silently as he had the first day. Sometimes at the creek, 
sometimes at the place that he had set the snare, where the boys went each morning to check it and their trap. And once outside the cabin, as Daniel was bringing in a load of firewood. Good, he said, nodding approvingly at the tall woodpiles. Your fire burns all winter. Daniel felt as pleased as he used to those rare times when Pa had told him that he'd done a good job. Solomon was there the morning they found a rabbit tangled in the noose of his snare. It was still alive, though, exhausted from struggling to free itself. Solomon broke off a heavy piece of branch and killed it with one blow. Dinner, he said, smiling, and he held out the rabbit to Daniel by its ears. Solomon would not join them in eating it, though. Daniel and Will both asked. Maybe he knew just how hungry for meat the boys were, or maybe he meant to keep his distance. Daniel wasn't sure. Fill your bellies, was all he said before disappearing again. Well, Daniel and Will filled their bellies with rabbit stew that night. And afterward, when they, when they had scraped the pot clean, they lay back on their elbows a little while from the, from the fire. Daniel was feeling warm and sleepy and full all the way to the top inside. He could barely remember the last time he'd felt that way. We need to learn how to set snares, Will said. Yeah, agreed Daniel. We'll ask Solomon tomorrow. The next day, the boys began asking questions. Solomon showed them where to find the plant whose fiber he had used for the snare. He showed them how to twist the thin strings to make them stronger. Use this for rope and for fishing net. For sewing shirts, maybe, he said, looking at the boys' ragged clothing. His quick flash of a smile made Daniel wonder if he was poking fun at them. In an open place in the forest where there were low bushes and high grasses, Solomon showed them how to set up snares on rabbit trails. Rabbits have trails? Will said, surprised. Look close. You see. For the first time, Daniel and Will looked closely at the ground, at beaten down grasses, barely bent stalks of plants, tiny broken off twigs, at how wild critters lived. Chimamus is like man, Solomon told them. He make trail from his house to water. They set snares along these trails, concealed by leaves and brush. At first their snares were clumsy things, and Daniel thought the rabbits and other wild critters were probably laughing at them. But they learned quickly, and soon Will's clever fingers were twisting and tying almost as expertly as Solomon's. On the third morning, when they went to check, they found a large rabbit dead in one of their snares, the noose tight around its neck. Again, the boys filled their bellies with rabbit stew, each day, it seemed, Solomon taught them something new. He showed them deer trails, though Daniel couldn't imagine how they could ever trap an animal as large as a deer. He also showed them an old Indian trail. If you follow half day, Solomon said, you come to a white man's mill. Well, that was good to know, Daniel thought. Their meal sack was dwindling fast, and if Pa and Ma didn't come soon, they would surely run out. On a cold, wet day, Solomon taught the boys a way to keep their feet dry. Gathering moss from the creek bank, he showed them how to stuff their shoes with it. Not only did the moss, did the moss soak up the rainwater, but it kept Daniel's feet warm, too. Not Will's, though. 
his shoes were so worn out, the moss began seeping out the cracks as soon as he took a step. And in a few more, it was gone. White boy shoes are no good, Solomon said. Moccasin better. White boys. Why did he always call them that? Daniel thought he heard a touch of scorn in those words. But Solomon helped Will tie his shoes together with rope made from twist, twisted plant fiber. What the Indian taught them most, though, was to see things, really see them, to keep their eyes and their ears alert for danger, no matter what they were doing and also to observe the smallest signs on the forest floor. Sometimes Solomon had a stillness in him, whether he was sitting on the creek bank gazing into the water or gliding noiselessly among the trees. Sometimes he would remain quiet a long time, not uttering a word, just staring at the ground. And then he would say something surprising. Wolves pass this way, chasing deer. He pointed at faint tracks in the damp earth. The rounded ones, the wolves. The sharply pointed ones, the deers. Far apart, because they were running, Solomon said. Or sometimes Solomon would pick up a feather so small and drab in color that Daniel never would have noticed it on the ground. Partridge nearby. Once walking along the path near the creek, Solomon suddenly stopped. Look, he said. Daniel and Will looked up. Sitting on a low branch, they made out the grayish-brown outline of a great horned hoot owl. Daniel took in a soft whistling breath. <sighs> Wasn't often you saw an owl in daylight, especially a great horned owl. He'd seen one only once before, hunting in the woods back home with Pa. How did you know it was there? asked Will. Solomon hadn't even looked up. Fresh droppings, on tree. Daniel would never have noticed. <laughs> Whoever had given Solomon his name, he thought, had known that he would grow into a wise man. And Daniel meant to remember his words for a long time. Look close. You see. The day after they saw the owl was the coldest that they had yet. Winter was coming for sure. Daniel could feel it in his bones. A chill drizzle fell all day, and wind rattled the tree branches. Daniel and Will kept inside, except for a quick trip out by Will to check their snares. But he came back empty-handed. Our deadfall trap fell down, he reported. Nothing inside. Solomon was right. Snares are much better. Well, Solomon didn't appear that day, nor the next. Daniel didn't think much of it, as sometimes he came without saying a word, and some days he didn't come at all. Tending, tending to his traps, Daniel figured. But by the third day, he began to wonder, could Solomon have gone back home, back to his people in the West, without saying goodbye? Daniel didn't think that he would do that. Might something have happened to him? An accident, perhaps? Daniel couldn't help remembering with a shiver their encounter with the bear. It could be that Solomon needed their help. But they didn't even know where to look for him. More than likely, Daniel told himself, he was just busy with his traps. On the morning of the fourth day, Daniel was at the woodpile when he felt that old feeling of someone watching him. He turned around, his arms full of wood, and there was Solomon. 
he knew before the Indian spoke that he had come to say goodbye. Sorry, something happened to my computer. Here we go. He carried a pack on his back, so heavily loaded with skins that he seemed bent under their weight. His face was solemn, and, and its lines looked deeper than usual. I must go now, he said, jerking his head toward the west. I come to say goodbye. Will stepped out of the cabin. Will you come back? he asked. Sometime, maybe, Solomon answered. He took something from his pack and held it out to Will. A present, he said. Daniel stared. In Solomon's hand was a pair of buckskin moccasins, just like the ones that he wore himself. White boy needs wusk boxen for winter. I made them for you. Will was staring, too. Then he grinned and gave a loud whoop. Woohoo! Moccasins! Real moccasins! Woohoo! Daniel remembered his manners. What would Ma say if she was here? We thank you kindly, Solomon, he said. Solomon nodded. Papa and Mama come soon. Was it a question? Daniel wasn't sure. But he nodded back. Very soon. Maybe today, he said. Good, said Solomon. And with a slight wave of his hand, he turned and walked into the trees. December. Chapter 11 tomorrow, my friends. Have a great night. Don't forget to go brush your teeth. Remember, it's important to brush each one of them. Spend a little time treasuring each one of those teeth in your mouth. Make sure they're nice and clean before you head to bed. Wash your hands and your face. Get into your pajamas. Tell your parents you love them. Tell your siblings you love them, too. They need to hear it once in a while. All right. Sweet dreams, everyone. Good night.